because we still have to pay our utility bills and our insurance and those things like that. And uh, you'll never own real estate. We own this real estate. Uh, Board for the Education of People of African Ancestry own this real estate. But uh, Dr. Amos Wilson pointed out that you never will own it in a capitalist country because that's why they call it the real estate. You see, because as long as they can charge you taxes, as long as they can jack up your insurance rates, you're always going to be paying something which will be the equivalent of like a rent. So um, give yourselves a round of applause for your generosity. We appreciate you. Um, unlike CMOTAP, BAPA does believe in taking uh, grants and stuff. CMOTAP takes no grants. We're out in Queens, but the Board for the Education of People of African Ancestry feel they're entitled to grants if they are advocates for education. But I want to tell you, over the last few years, not a dime of grants has come in. On paper, there are grants. On paper, there's a couple of assemblymen, and so they said they gave this amount, whatever it is, the money has never come in. And documents after documents have been filed. They would really like us to lose this property. So, uh, but fortunately, because of your generosity, and because of the generosity of the members of the board, who uh, take our heavy annual dues that they pay, we've been able to hold on to it. And we intend to continue to hold on to it. Uh, at this point, we're going to have, before our question and answer period, we're going to have our resident, uh, our, po our poet in residence, uh, if he is prepared, or if he wants to, if he's ready, we're going to call up Brother D. Nubian. Poet extraordinaire. I don't have a poem directly to the subject, um, but I got something. Also, the flyers in my hand, I would like folks to get two of these flyers when the program is over for our uh, discussion series that we have at Tom Mary Temple on Monday nights, and there's going to be like six more. And this is the topic for tomorrow and the next week. Now, I want to tell you something that you've probably heard before. African people under siege. That's a one-sided war. Against a world disorder evil to the core. Creating super rich and many, many poor. Now war is not a state in which we want to be. We would prefer to live in peaceful harmony, but not only must we fight the force of poverty, we must fight extermination, we must be free. We may like to party, but we must prepare. Struggle intensifying, and we should be clear. This we should, we should not ignore saying, I don't care about what happens to our people, whether here or there. Don't let intimidation stop you. Listen here. Proper love for us people will cast out fear. Proper love for us people will cast out fear. Proper love for us people will cast out fear. Proper love for us people will cast out fear. Proper love for us people will cast out fear. Proper love for us people will cast out fear. Our culture was disrupted many years ago as our people went from living high to very low. To this side of Atlantic, some were forced to go, and many more were killed and living here, now don't you know? At the Berlin Conference 1884 and 5, Europeans carved up Africa just like a pie. So based on land the labor took from eye and eye, Western world standard of living is very high. Now we may like to party, but we must prepare. To go intensifying, and we should be clear. This we should not ignore, saying, I don't care about what happens to my people, here or there. Don't let intimidation stop you listening here. Proper love for us people will Cast out fear. Proper love for us people will cast out fear. Proper love for us people will cast out fear. Our struggle is understand our struggles are protracted one, a long, long drawn out process, long time begun. Proper reading of conditions tell what must be done. Sometimes we use diplomacy, sometimes a gun. Sometimes we use our music helping people see the need to serve our own kind first and foremostly. And where we are the resident majority in this land, we should control our community. Mm -hmm. We must teach our people in America that we're connected to what happens in Africa. Mm -hmm. Wrote this in the 70s. White South Africa invaded into Angola, killing our people trying to stop Namibia. 
From gaining independence from the western beast to defeat this evil, our struggle must increase. And when we liberate South Africa, at least, we can rejoice, but still our struggle should not cease. From here, we must transfer modern technology. United Free Africa is priority. And that will be the base of black security, and we can help create a new world harmony. But now, we may like to party, but we must prepare. Struggle intensifying, and we should be clear. This we should not ignore, saying, I don't care. But what happens to our people, here or there? Don't let intimidation stop you listening here. Proper love for one's people will cast out fear. You know, call and response is something else. And when the brother can get you, think of what you had to say over and over. That was hypnotic. Cast out fear. Give him another round of applause. Brother, you and this time we're gonna um, we're gonna call up both of our uh, debaters. No jostling or punching or, or anything like that is permitted. But it's really our question and answer period. Uh, you can line up over here if you want to ask a question. Uh, Brother Gilchrist will tell you to step forward so that you can be on the camera. And feel free to ask any question that you want to. Uh, I'm going to take the privilege of asking the first question. I want to know if you can tell us any more about anything special that Delaney did regarding with respect to his practice of medicine. And I want to know if Nicaragua has anything to do with Delaney. And I also want to know about his historical writings on things like Ethiopia and other stuff like that. Well, he, he, he worked with the uh, uh, epidemic of cholera. That was one of his one medical issues that he dealt with. Uh, Nicaragua, I know he wanted to uh, in Central America, that was part of the, the immigration. Yeah, immigration. Mm -hmm. And he did attend, there was a big medical conference in England, and he attended to make a report on uh, the health and medical issues in West Africa. And I forgot the name of the convention, I didn't know. But something else, too, um, he was one of the first African Americans to write a document translating hieroglyph into English. Right after the Champagne, what's his name? Champagne, Leon, Champagne. 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 But before Brestet got involved, and it was a piece he had written on ethnology on, Af on ancient Egypt and Ethiopia, which is still an extraordinary document because the only person I know that has done anything with it has been Brother Mario Beatty, um, um, who was out of, I think, Howard University. He also he wrote a novel called Blake yes. about the Hudson. Banks in Mississippi and about a person who was revolutionary. Thank you. Which started his pattern after himself. So. I, I can give you another special thing with Brent, the President of the United States. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'd like to hear it. <laughs> yeah, read, read, read that. Read that. I, read that. I, I just love this. This is what I read all the time, no matter what my speech is about. <laughs> and this is in September. 18, 1850, and Congress had just passed the Fugitive Slave Act, and it was far more drastic than the law of 18, 1793. And it said, if a white man took an oath that a black man was his slave, federal marshals and commissioners were obliged to return him to slavery, and all good citizens were commanded to aid and assist. Any black was liable to arrest and sold into slavery on the claim of a white man. The law which denied blacks the right to testify on their own behalf or to have a jury trial was an open invitation to the slave catchers. So a lot of the white abolitionists at this meeting in Allegheny were saying, well, well, you know, we don't know what we're going to do now. So Delaney gets up and he says, um, he couldn't be silent. So he says, shelving his medical school application, he joined with others, abolitionists, to plan resistance to this law. So he felt not fear but cold rage when he rose to address a mass meeting in the market house at Allegheny on September 30th. The speakers who preceded him was the mayor of Allegheny and the congressman from that district and so forth. And so he says, to suppose to repeal is to anticipate the overthrow of the Union. Leaving morality and right out of the question, the fugitive slave law is necessary for the national compact, meaning America needs this as a slave state if it's going to exist. 
said, we must look at facts as they really are, he said. We can, or what can we do, these are my glasses, that's my own. <laughs> what can we do, shall, shall we submit to be sent into bondage? Shall we fly or shall we resist? Honorable Mayor, whatever ideas of liberty I may have, have been received from reading the lives of your revolutionary fathers. I have therein learned that a man has a right to defend his castle and his life, even unto the taking of life. Sir, my house is my castle, and that castle are my wife and children. If any approaches that house in search of a slave, let it be the president, surrounded by his cabinet and his bodyguard, as his bodyguard, with the de Declaration of Independence waving above his head as his banner, and the Constitution upon his breast as his shield. If he crosses the threshold of my door, and I do not lay him a lifeless corpse at my feet, I hope the grave may refuse my body a resting place in righteousness, heaven may my spirit a home. No, he cannot enter the house, and we both live. So it's page 119, Martin Delaney, 18. In the same passage is the word about an angel, about his, when he said that it resides his wife and children in the pool. Something about angels? No, I don't see anything about angels okay. in that movie. Okay. okay. But I just, you know, like, like many men, at that time struggling, because you got to remember, this is people dying every day. We see the shooting and stuff when we get out raised a day, like mm -hmm. the brother in South Carolina and then the young boy in Cleveland. But imagine if you were living in slavery, where <laughs> every day in every community where you were, such kind of atrocities were happening. And then you had a population like Delaney and, 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 and Douglas who are free and fighting against this thing, and then most of your population, you know what they're going through on a daily basis which is total genocide. So every day for them was a resistance day in some way. You know, Every day had to be a resistance day. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, Step forward. Just, a, just a comment to get your reaction. Step forward. Uh, Step forward uh, oh, for the camera. Just a comment for your reaction. First of oh, all, yeah. uh, I was very impressed with the task that, that, that you tried to execute because I wouldn't try to get through to save one of these guys against the other. They, they're just too powerful. But in terms of Delaney, there are a couple of things that are crucial in terms of the 20th century that I think we all want to reinforce. One, he is the first African-American political theorist. Political theorist of national liberation. And he comes at a time when Germany was not a unified nation. Italy wasn't a unified nation. Greece was struggling to get out from under the oppression of the Ottoman Empire, right? He sees African Americans in the context of a worldwide struggle of what would later be called oppression issues for liberation. So he's one of the first people to take that up. A second thing which I think you didn't mention was his trip incognito through the slave states into Texas and into free territory, right? Territory, what what happened, right? Awesome. Where he develops a concept that we would today call the third world, right? Where he sees there are, there are alliances that we can develop with Spanish-speaking people and Native Americans, whatever. It was bullets that he, he was thinking about, you know, when you were asking Honduras, right? Uh, and the third thing was he goes to Liberia, even though, oh God, no. He was very much opposed to it, but he does go when he goes to Nigeria. He goes to Liberia. He gives a speech. There's a young Edward Wilmot Blyden in the audience. And in that speech, he says, you know, Africa for the Africans. Right? Blyden hears that. Blyden is a direct connected to Marcus Garvey. And so that becomes a major theme of, of 20th century Pan-Africanism. So there's so many things theoretically about Delaney. All right? And the fact that he wrote the stuff down, he puts down for, you know, that, that's important in the 20th century. Just one last comment very briefly. All of those 19th century black leaders got burnt at one time or another mm -hmm. because of, of, of the impact of Western dominant thinking on their education and their minds. And they had to fight their way through. And that's reflected in mistakes that they all made. And Delaney wasn't an exception. Right. He initially had a very paternalistic attitude toward indigenous Africans. But when he went, he writes about the impact of actually living amongst Africans, how 
his opinion changed drastically. In that sense, he's the same as Cromwell. Alexander Cromwell, who spends 20 years as a missionary who goes there with the noble savage notion, right? Spends 20 years there, and his whole perspective on indigenous Africans changed. So we have people, and, and you know, we can see the same transformation for Douglas. So what's interesting when you look at time, place, and condition, right? As these people experience a changing world, they also change, but they don't make mistakes. And when they make mistakes, they make some bad ones. You know what I mean? But it doesn't lessen the statute. Right. Well, I, I think you just gave an extraordinary and I said I asked you to come up here on my behalf earlier. <laughs> 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 but, oh, the bills, yeah. Don't be shy, you're trying to get on the camera, come on. Oh, it's, oh, what do you mean, are you next? Oh, no, no. Okay, I want to ask a question, sure. and it's probably your answer. I'm struck by the language that was so much more rich and expressive than uh, the way we communicate with each other today. What is the cause of that evolution of Dumb language usage, that's Betty Dobson's expression of it. I, it's, it's amazing when you read how these men wrote so eloquently. Because they wrote. Oh. People, people don't write. When you write, you have to be uh, more concise. And they were very eloquent. Even like Civil War letters, just ordinary farmers writing letters to their wives or family, they're very eloquent. Because they had, I think they had better education and sent it broader, even though it was westernized. Because they knew the Bible, they knew Shakespeare, they knew the classics. I mean, Douglas made, made references to Cicero or, or something else that was, you know, even though it was ancient, they could make those references because he was exposed to it. When, when you realize that um, a Delaney can write a treaty on ethnology when he's looking at the languages of Ethiopia and Egypt, when he's talking about the religions of those nations back then, but these men were also journalists. And mm -hmm. remember, you're a journalist, you're writing for the public, and you have to be impeccable. So you also talk about journalists, and the whole abolition movement, journalism was, at the, was the key weapon of that movement, and the ability to articulate your situation. And so I think that had a lot to do with yeah, that. I, th I think they use language as a weapon. It's a weapon because you can arouse emotions, either for or against just by the use of words. I mean, Malcolm X was very skillful at this as well. Absolutely, yeah. I would just like to make a note on, on one thing, because I, like I said, both of these guys are my heroes, so either or very difficult for me. And, but one of the things that Delaney did in a number of his speeches, and he wrote it, in the, even at the time when him and Douglas had the, almost the tete a tete when they were co-editing, and oh, wow. Douglas decided that we're gonna now put our initials on our own, uh, Articles. Uh, articles, so people can know which one is Douglas <laughs> and which one is the lady, because he's saying some stuff that's crazy. But one of the things the lady was saying during that period of time was that we should build a national identity here that can form a national, I don't know what you call it, a nation within a nation, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then that nation within the nation would develop the relationship with the other black nations around the world. That is still seen, that still seemed to be a unique concept today, you know, we're still trying to talk about it. He didn't do a lot of details on it, but he did raise it, and he also raised the question of you had to have culture in order to legitimately or to be able to carry on real resistance. The consciousness for real resistance had to be the result of the fact that you could develop a culture that was exclusively yours, or that was yours, understood to be yours. Well, nobody else has a question? Because I will go again. <laughs> Can you stand up? Can we get you on camera? Brother Matt? I came across uh, something that he wrote about that I thought that I really had. I thought this was the uh, observation of 20th century Egyptologists and historians. He pointed out the difference in the number of pyramids and and structures in Egypt and Ethiopia over 
Europe. And he reasoned something. And I was wondering, are you familiar with that? Well, he said, well, if, the, if, if, if our civilization didn't precede those civilizations, why would Europeans come to Africa to build these great monuments? <laughs> right? <laughs> it's, it's common sense, right? Yeah. It's common sense. Why do we have the greatest stuff if they, if, if, if they built it? And I mean, he wrote these things and he uh, uh, kind of went into them a little bit. And so I, I thought that was, you know, just as a historian. Well, I, I can partially answer because um, I, sp I, I lived in Ethiopia for two years, okay. back in the early 60s. And I took a three day hike to a place called Lalibella. Mm -hmm. Where you have ten churches carved out of solid rock on yes. the mountainside, mm -hmm. and they go back over a thousand years. And the rumor was some Greeks got lost. <laughs> you know, instead of acknowledging African engineering skills. Yes. And and, and Ethiopia has a lot of these rock hewn churches, and the the, the obelisk uh, in Aksum. There was one that was taken to Rome uh, when the Italians invaded in 1935, and they just returned it about two, three years ago. They're still trying to figure out how to erect it so it doesn't fall over. <laughs> but it was put up over a thousand years ago yes. by so-called primitive people mm -hmm. who have skills in engineering. Yeah, so my lecture yesterday in Cleveland was on the Rock Human Churches in Alabama. Okay. <laughs> But this piece, I just wanted to go back on, on, on this Delaney piece, because they, had, they seem to have had access to it. You know, do you remember when, just before I got into college, they were still teaching Greek and Latin in colleges. Now, today we may reject Greek and Latin in, in a certain context, but remember then, they were studying these things, learning these languages, which means you are also learning that history. And they had a broader sense of even European history than we have today. Mm -hmm. And definitely had a broader sense of African history. We're just beginning now with all this technology to grasp African history. Mm -hmm. So I just want to mention this piece that he wrote by a name. I want to get it proper. Um, and this, this is um, the young man, Dr. Beatty, wrote this. And, and he's talking about Delaney translate Egyptian hieroglyph in a text entitled, The Principles of Ethnology, The Origins of Race and Color, with an archaeological compendium of Ethiopian and Egyptian civilization from years of careful examination and inquiry. And this was done in 1879. So I, I'm, I was amazed when I was reading many, many years ago David Walker's appeal, and he has a reference to Egypt in the appeal. David Walker, you know. Mm -hmm. But something was afoot, and I think one of the things that we may not pay much attention to, and I was glad to say I'm one of them, Prince Hall Masonry. And Prince Hall Masons was a very dominant mm -hmm. instrument in the black community during almost the entire period of slavery after the British leaves this country. And all of these men have some sort of relationship to Prince Hall Masonry and the AME Church but both founders were members of the Prince Hall and Santa mm. Lodge. So they was some sort of, and, and I remember my master's thesis was on Prince Hall as a continuing educational forum. So maybe we are not looking at where the education was coming from. And if Prince Hall was one of the primary teaching institutions at that point of higher education for our people, this is during slavery, then these men had access to information that we may not consider to be information we could get, not even normal access to today. Mm. Mm. I'm sorry, you just, I'm just going to stand up. Uh, you just really thought, sorry, you, 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 okay, well he, 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 you sparked another thought, what you just said, uh, has nothing to do with Delaney and, and, um, and, and President Douglas. Uh, I read that Nat Turner, when he talked about what he saw, he saw hieroglyphic writing in the sky and blood on the leaves. So I don't know where, you know, certainly he wasn't a Prince Hall Mason, you know what I mean? How do you uh, know that term? <laughs> it's a <the> secret society. It's <laughs> a secret society. Okay. So, well, that's yeah. how I know that. And remember, the Prince Hall and them, this is 17, what? Uh, after the British, British loses the war in 1776, this is when Prince Hall Masonry takes off. 
They had the option to leave America. They choose to leave to stay in America because they felt as long as their brothers and sisters were enslaved, they had an obligation to stay and fight. Okay. And that. so a lot of the people who would get involved in the body of knowledge would probably be people who are still enslaved. Even though the laws that America wrote against them said that you could not bring an enslaved person into the lodge. But we know that the, the, the information when you're dealing with society of secrets and secret societies. Um, as you saw, there was another secret society, not Freemasonry, performing at Dr. Ben's funeral. And that was kind of being outed because most people don't know they exist. Isn't the origins of Masonry, uh, don't they come from ancient Egypt? Uh, no, Masonry as it stands do not own up to ancient Egypt, except in the higher places and the quiet places. <laughs> In the over places, they said that Genesis is in England, Scotland. Mm -hmm. What's the truth? <laughs> <laughs> the truth is, we know the truth that if the origins are in Egypt. I did a paper on it on the 6th of right. February. Um, Freemasonry, Egypt's black child. Would you elaborate on it a little no, bit? No, not today. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thank you guys so much for sharing such rich information about history. My question would just be that, you know, if um, just judging that we're nominally free now, but we're still experiencing a lot of the hatred and atrocities that we experienced back then, um, even though it may not be so much. I just wonder, what do you think Delaney or Douglas would have said um, as far as guiding us now to come out of this? Because for me as a young adult, all I see is continual frustration of us trying to come out of oppression. So that's just my question. Good question. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, we dug this and talked about, you know, there's no struggle, there's no progress. You know, and power concedes nothing without the demands. Uh, my reading of that time period is that a lot of people were into organizations. It, they weren't necessarily successful. I mean, you had Afro-American League in 1890 and then the Afro-American Council a few years later in the Niagara movement. Uh, they had these conventions, you know, color men's conventions, national, regional, you know, local ones. Yes, I mean, if you look at the list of, of attendees, there's some pretty great minds who were there. You know, people who, who wrote, who, who wrote in newspapers, who wrote pamphlets, and they had, see, it's my personal belief is every issue that we deal with today was discussed in the 19th century. Yes. Everything that we talk about today is already discussed. It's just that we don't know about it because we don't study the past that much. Mm -hmm. And if we did, we wouldn't have the predicaments that we have today because we knew that they, they had solutions back then. Mm -hmm. And I agree with, with Dr. That, that we were much more organized towards freeing ourselves then. The convention movements, which we hear little about, was a big part of that organizing strategy. Almost every state, every major city, every major community had a convention movement of some sort. And the people who headed those different movements collaborated nationally with one another. And um, today, we have also, we're probably one of the most over-organized communities in the country. But we don't have the collaboration they had back then. And so Douglas called to organize. He was very strong and struggled. Struggle, the first phase of the struggle means you must organize. And so, even today, when we look at the atrocities, I'm not big on marching and demonstrating, never was. Um, I think we need to sit down and organize and analyze why something is happening, what is happening, and what we can do to stop it, and not ask someone else to stop hurting me, what I can do to make sure they don't hurt me. That needs to be the direction we go into. Because it doesn't seem to help to say, stop hurting me. So let's come up with how do we stop the person from hurting us. And that may take, I don't know what the direction is, but if you get enough people collaborating in the discussion, I think we can come up with something appropriate. You know? now, we're, we're very fortunate because a lot of these conventions were published at that time, and they've been reprinted since in several multi-volumes, and they're available. Is that the answer to her question? Well, she wanted to know what would they say now, and they would say organize. He said, well, you know, Douglas says there can be no, um, 
you know, my brain is tired. <laughs> 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 so, so that's right. what it is. You've got to struggle. Struggle means, I always tell everybody, there should not be a single black man or woman that don't belong to an organization, a black organization, and participate in that organization mm -hmm. to meet its goals and, and, and objectives. And, but there need to be more collaboration between organizations. Right. Yeah. And we don't get enough of that. And I just saw that with Dr. Ben's funeral. I won't call names. But you have no idea in the two weeks of trying to put together the financing and different things, the tooth that had to be pulled to this high leader, not speaking to this high leader and this high leader, don't want to have nothing to do with this high leader. And I said, wait a minute. Y'all all gonna have some trouble from me if you don't do something, right? So nobody wants to be dealing with me on that level of trouble, but that shouldn't be. Even even these two men who fought, they still kept dialogue. Okay, and, and if you don't have a dialogue mm -hmm. working towards solution, you're not gonna find solution. There're gonna always be different approaches. I favor even today migrating back to Africa as much as we can. But I also favor, this is our home. This has been our home. People say, why haven't you changed your name? Because I don't know how to get rid of Papa and Mama and Grandpa and Great Grandpa. Okay? And so I have to keep their name. I changed my children's names to African names, and I gave them all one of these American names that our parents hold because I believe in ancestral linkages. And I cannot abandon the work they've done, the struggle they've done, and all the things that we've accomplished. When you look at our history, if we just take the period that we're talking about right now, which is one of the least talked about periods in our history. It is one of the most extraordinary sure. periods in the history of African American peoples, or African peoples in modern times. When we talk about 1850 to 1930, take that period. It is the most extraordinary history with the most extraordinary men and women doing some of the most extraordinary things. Like the brother said, most of the things we're dealing with now, they were dealing with then. Uh, the Afro-American League and the Afro-American Council, and there was a woman's organization who really pushed that title back then. They were fighting along with this guy, had a bill called the Blair Education Bill out of Rhode Island. That wasn't that fundamentally different from Brown versus the board. It didn't get passed in Congress, but, you know, these men fought and women fought very hard to get it passed. That was popular for uh, equal funding in schools. Because schools are segregated and states control the funding, and we got short change in that regard. So we, we have to look at this thing of organization and organizational leadership being able to collaborate around the issues that affect our people. And this issue that's going on now, for instance, with the constant gunning down every weekend, I, the, where I was in, in Cleveland this weekend, uh, this is my third year of being invited by the Black Policemen's Association out there. And these young black men and women are doing some extraordinary things in the black community. And so, um, Brother uh, Kaba Hiawatha Booker was with me this time around. And they're looking at what they can do as black policemen to collaborate with other black police organizations around the country to bring a stop to the stuff since it's coming out of an institution that they're a part of. So that was our dialogue for the weekend. You know? And so, we have to look at the fundamental question. People are shooting up people down, and the way this thing is being done, is there a national conspiracy in this institution? We know the Klan has always been in the police department. Sure. <laughs> we know there are other white supremacist organizations that's very structurally organized. But what we're seeing right now is something that, that tends to appear to be deliberately provocative of our community, and what is the end game to that provoking? So we need to have some discussion on this stuff. Something is going on, you know. And if we don't bring our heads together, no matter what our different ideological perspectives may be, we may not figure it out before it's too late. Another question? Yeah. Uh, anybody want to speak to? Yeah, just step back. Oh, that's right. Anybody want to speak to the role of Delaney's wife uh, in yeah. his development, uh, and also? his notion of what the role of black women would be in the struggle? Well, I'm not that strong on it. I mean, I know that she was a seamstress. I know that she financed much of what he did, especially in those latter years. Um, but I didn't really have a chance to really look at what his perspective was in that regards to the role of the yeah, woman. She had a tremendous impact on, on him. He, 
in fact, the Stanford. National Conventions of the you know, 1850s, where they had that temporary but intense schism, he allowed women for the first time to attend a black convention. That was the from that, from convention. the 1830s up to that point, women could not be delegates in black conventions. But the Nassau's conventions had women because he believed that uh, uh, the strength of a race ultimately depended on the strength of women. And how could you have educated kids if your women were uneducated? So they had a very, very progressive position on the role of women. But he got that from his wife because like so many leaders, he was tripping a life fantastic all over the world. Mm -hmm. And I think they had, what, six or seven kids, mm -hmm. right? She's raising those kids and, they, they, you know, they're very progressive and uh, they also yeah, have a history. One of his name, two sons, one of his name, Ramesses, one of yeah. his name, um, That's right. after the Dumas. Yeah, and, and, and his kids, you know, just like Frederick Douglass, both of them, their kids fought in the war. And I think Douglas is, could survive it, but the lady lost a kid in the war, in the Civil War. That was a big tragedy in, in, in the family. But I, in my study, I always thought that his position was very, very progressive on what women should do. And of course, many times nationalists take the rap that they don't have a progressive right. position. But on I, I think both were strong, because even though Douglas had to take that position when it came to the vote, yeah. Douglas had already been a, an advocate. He had a very progressive uh, position. Strong. Woman involvement, yeah. but I understood quite well yeah. why he took that position. Yeah, he had another God's contradiction, but he, you know. Well, that should mean that. Where's Macintosh? He's right. Uh, maybe you can answer this one. Uh, oh, <laughs> well, the wife of the wife of Frederick Douglass, Anna, you know, was very instrumental for his freedom because she, like I said before, she uh, helped to finance his escape. But she was illiterate. They were married about 50 years, and he never taught her to read nor write. And that's, I don't know why, I mean, it seemed very strange, I think, but from a psychological viewpoint, uh, why did he keep her in that position? Want to stand here and answer? I can, yeah, I can answer this very easily. Can you, you want to go on camera? I can answer this very easily. This is the answer. I cut a lot of classes in medical school. <laughs> and when this was discussed, I was out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it seems strange because I me mean, Mary Helen was just a white woman. She was educated. She was his secretary. Yeah. She helped him with his uh, one of his autobiographies, and and she was yeah. very very much in in the uh, abolitionist movement. But so was Anna. Yeah. Yeah, Anna was involved with the uh, female anti-slavery society in Boston, and then plus in Rochester she had she had runaways. So she was very instrumental in, in you know, activist, but he never taught her to read and write. Wow. Mm -hmm. Or, or allow her to go out someplace else and to learn to read and write. So. You're going to have to have a seance and have Frederick come back to play. <laughs> yeah, but of course, you know, what's also interesting, talk about Delaney, you know, Douglas said to Delaney, uh, I thank God for being a man, but Delaney thanks God for having made him a black, black man, man yeah. right? He's very proud of that. Well, but his wife was blonde haired, blue eyed, even though she was a sister. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you know, that dialogue, you got to remember at that time, they were just like it developed more extremely in Southern Africa, the question of colored and black. Yeah. But we had that here. That's true. And, and, and in a place like Virginia, it was very extreme. And even in upstate New York, it was very extreme. Um, and so that had to be part of the dialogue because those were the persons who had access to advantages. Yeah. It was rare to have a dark skinned person like uh, Delaney in this type of position and at that time. Dark and, yeah, at that time. So, but that was a part of the reality of this coming up out of slavery and this resistance to slavery. The people who led much of that resistance would be the people we would call colors and mulattoes. Because they were the ones that had access to enough freedom to formulate that kind of resistance outside of the plantation itself. Okay, um, Frederick Douglass I want to revisit one of Bill's questions. He asked, he spoke to the fact that these men, that they came under a lot of flat. And I don't think he was just talking about that, that, verbal that. flat. Okay. I mean, this is okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm asking, really, I'm asking Bill, can you speak a little bit more to the kind of flat they took? They didn't just take verbal flat. 
uh, neither Delaney nor nor um, um, Douglas. Douglas. They both got those guys. I know that Douglas, for instance, you know, he was attacked by a mob for yeah. being with a, you know. So I mean, I don't know if you that want to elaborate on that. That was a dangerous, dangerous. That's a dangerous, dangerous time. Even free blacks were not free. I mean, that was a term. It was a label, but that was an actual, you know. And they didn't have any rights. They didn't have the protection of the state. They didn't really have, what's that word, um, um, the guy with it. They didn't have any sanctuary, legal sanctuaries. It was rare where they could find legal sanctuaries. So white males felt they can bring any assaults they want, but those men knew that when they walked out of their doors in the morning. What year are we talking about? We're talking about the entire period of slavery, and especially the period that they're working in, that's, that's going up to the Civil War, that two decades before the Civil War. That's when these men are working. And this is the time that the people who feel they're about to lose their economic foundation has gotten more vicious. That's why you get the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act, which uh, was a, right, a right, very right. vicious document, you know, right, compared right, to the right, one back right. in the 1790s. Well, Douglas, I mean, Douglas was attacked. You know, he tried to give lectures, and he was attacked. And he was so used to being attacked, particularly uh, you know, insults, name calling, and so forth, that when he went to Europe, he remarked that he would walk into a restaurant and the white patrons kind of look up and like just nod, like, hello. Mm -hmm. So he was waiting for nigger stench, nigger stench. <laughs> you know, I mean, he was waiting for that. He was so used to it in America. But he said there, they just treated him like anybody else. He's just a patron in a restaurant or a patron in a hotel. And um, you know, as a result, uh, he saw what it meant to be treated as a man without all the, all the underlying prejudices and discrimination. But still, I mean, everybody got attacked in some form, either verbal attack or physical attack. They're speaking the truth. Well, they burned a hotel down on top of the lane. He just got out of the nick of time. Remember, we, we, lost, we, we lost David Walker during that period, and those are the ones we know of. You, you're talking about a state terrorism that didn't just exist where slavery exists, but it was across the entire nation. Exactly. Mm. And even for the free blacks, freedom was, was, was conditional. Well, we, saw, we saw what happened here in 1863 when Irish went on right. rampage, yeah. and they were just lynching people in the streets. So, so that, that was the reality of the day. And, and fundamentally, it's not that much difference today. Right. You know? Because I know when I travel around the country a lot, I travel expecting to die any moment. So I don't eat certain things, I don't eat certain places, I don't, I, when I leave, when I get on that plane, everybody I'm going to come in contact with, my wife and my sons, have the telephone number, the name of the persons, and their addresses. Because you don't know, you know, because there's still the same force that want to hold on to the same privilege and see you as a threat, even today. There's one aspect of that question. Step out, please. There's one aspect of the question Brother McIntosh asked us. I didn't want to throw out there. Frederick Douglass used to like that. There's one instance where he took a white woman on each arm and strolled down the street. All right? Mm -hmm. That gets you killed very quickly. <laughs> right? Delaney's married to a, blonde, a, a woman who appears to be white. You know, yeah, a blonde haired, blue eyed woman. Mad, I think, right? yeah. That's a mother. Uh, I'm not sure, because the family came from that New Orleans thing. Uh, yeah, one, one, of, one of the members yeah, of her family good, was yeah. <laughs> So, you know, and he's out there, with this, he's married to this woman, you see what I mean? It was almost as if they were saying that you're not going to impose your racial hierarchy on me, and I'm going to go yeah. to your most sacred cow and throw it right back in your face. And both Douglas and Delaney, you know, had that, had that in them and, and probably ran great risk because of it. Yeah, but remember, this is about money. This is all about money. It's about banking. It's about this new thing that's being formed that is called the corporate structure. It's just coming to birth at this time, and it's coming to birth out of this money that's coming from slavery. And the, the fear of losing the resources that's about to produce this perceived cash cow made people do some very dangerous and damaging things. Can you stop here? But we want to thank everyone, and thank you, Dr.
take a picture of you too? Sisters, I think we were treated to a uh, uh, history lesson from all around. Let's have a round of applause for our kids. At this point, we're going to close uh, in unity. These guys over here, they may punch at each other a little bit, but the rest of them, no, I'm teasing. We're all, all of this, they all know that the, the, the debate is simply a pedagogical tool to teach the history. If we say we're going to talk about Delaney, uh, or we're going to talk about a certain number of people, when we say we're going to have a debate about which one is greater, people seem to be attracted to that more. So what we're going to do now, though, is we and always to make sure we close in unity, we have a couple of elders who we ask to come up and, uh, and speak to us. Uh, with time is at our heels, so we're going to ask them you know, to, uh, keep, to collectively put their remarks down to a total of 10 minutes. We'll call up uh, both together Sister Rosalind and Dr. Leonard Jeffries to close us out. He did it. He did it. You were out. Betty's asking for poetry by Brother D, but Brother D already did it when she went downstairs. So you're going to have to watch the tape. <laughs> what about the uh, raising some money? Did you get enough money or you want to go? I, I, I mean, I, I think people ask people to give what they could. I believe they gave what they could. I, I usually I tell the amount. Today I didn't say, uh, thanks to your generosity, Clark House received $455. Give yourself a round of applause. See you at Clark House. It's always a pleasure, um, in deference to the real Holomite, my wife, I'll let her go first. <laughs> uh, she's never speechless, but she is tired. I got up out of bed to come uh, to uh, bring our nephew here, uh, Stefan. And uh, Rosalyn and I have just been through a uh, great experience for our people. And it involves the dilemma of discussing Douglas and Delaney, uh, two important individuals who were part of that struggle to restore African humanity. And each of them had their own path uh, to do that. And uh, this weekend, thanks to uh, the forces coming together, our ancestral forces, the creator of the universe, we were able to send off a, a brother who represents the spirit of Delaney and Douglas, and that's Dr. Yosef ben -Yakini. And uh, we were also able to have a conference take place at the same time, and that conference was a summit on reparations uh, instituted by, by the CARICOM, the, the Caribbean, uh, reparations group, and it involved the installation of an African-American reparations group. And they were within a hundred yards of each other. One was at Abyssinian Baptist Church, the other was at Mother Zion. So you can have conflicts if you want, but it's the same struggle. Where, that's why you have to have a systems analysis. White folks may have differences, but it's the same system. They got you playing Democrats and Republicans, but the system is the system of white supremacy. And then the key to understanding systems is economics, politics, and culture. And so it was wonderful to be able to see this weekend us come together in a difficult situation and deal with the question of economics. Uh, we've got to control who we are all about. And politics, you have to have a political formation to make the economics work. And then culture is uh, the key. And the person who really put his heart and soul out, tapped into a special source of power and energy and spirituality is our brother, Professor James Small. Let's give him an acknowledgement. <laughs> so all of these great men have been involved in Mission Impossible, up against the odds of a very complex system of so many dimensions. And they decided to make their contribution. So you have to weave these contributions uh, together, the Harriet Tubmans and the 
Sojourner Truth and Ivy Wells, along with the brothers and sisters, but also the grassroots, your great grandmothers and great grandfathers, and the families and institutions that allowed us to survive. Uh, last time I was in Washington, D.C., when my nephew was being inaugurated as a congressman, we went to see the statuary in the Congress. And there's a fantastic statuary of Frederick Douglass. And he's there, and on the one side of the statue is, if there is no struggle. And you know, all of us have used that. But on the other side was not the external struggle, but the internal struggle. Mm. And it says something like, no matter what you throw at me, no matter what you do to me, my internal consciousness and power is such that you can't change me. That's a, I'm going to have to go back to the Capitol and pick that up. Because that's a, uh, it's an internal and external struggle. And don't get them confused. All of them have to go on simultaneously. And my wife and I, she has been involved in looking at African history before I was, she first went in 1960, then I went in 61, then we met, and then we got married in 64 here in Harlem. But it's about struggle. And these brothers, you can look at their differences, their different approaches, but you have to see them as making the contribution uh, as a collective process of restoring African humanity. So there, there is a book um, by a um, Swanston, writing about John Henry Clark, and he talks about his early visit to Ghana. And um, there was, uh, he was kind of like staying with the house guests, Dankwa, and uh, was able to go into the courts with him to observe one of the early court situations. And um, he sat there and the criminal, um, was uh, talked about, the fellow stole some money, and it was the money that his co-workers had, you know, worked and worked and hard, etc. And uh, so <coughs> he was uh, taken in for taking the money, you know, to, to be pr uh, prosecuted, etc. And so apparently he uh, 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 paid for his little time and said yes, he took the money and uh, he ended up squandering the money you know, a pile of money, and he, you know, he didn't, just was giving it out like uh, it was incredible, no end to it. And so that's why the people were so upset. And so um, after he paid his, his uh, 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 fee and he served his little bit of time, then the judge uh, kind of let the whole, they thought it was over. And so Dr. Cl John Henry Clark said, oh, good. Uh, that's it. That's the end of the situation. At home, he said that to, to uh, his lawyer friend. He said, no, you have this Western point of view. That's not the end of the case. Uh, it's not over. And so what they had to do was to restore the reputation of the man. And so they had to bring him back in front of all of the people, the people he worked for, and he took the money, et cetera. And then he had to uh, beg their pardon and talk about all kinds of things. But in the process, they had asked his wife, uh, uh, you know, how did this happen? And so the wife said, well, uh, he's a good husband. He's been a good, thrifty man dealing with his money and everything. but." Apparently, he had had this dream all along of being a wealthy man. And so all of a sudden, that's why he got the money, stole the money, so that he could go around giving it out to fulfill this inner crave where he wanted to be a wealthy man. And so after everybody understood the psychological reason for the crime, that he was an ordinary man but with great dreams, and then they said, okay, now we know what your aberration was. We restore you. And so during the reparation conference, they were talking about uh, reparation, restitution, and respect, those three things. And uh, I think it was um, uh, uh, Reverend Dillon 
And so when he was mentioning that, that's why I was thinking about John Henry Clark. Mm. Because he's saying, they're saying that yes, uh, even 5,000 blacks were hung <laughs> and killed at, certain, at a certain point uh, in, uh, in the history, in the Holocaust, uh, af way after the um, uh, period of um, Reconstruction. And then coming on toward the Harlem Renaissance, you had these large numbers of blacks being killed. So he said, that's terrorism. Mm -hmm. Terrorism. And so therefore, what we call the great Harlem migration and the mm -hmm. migration to other Harlems all over the, and he said, that's refugees. Mm -hmm. And so we needed refugee status from running away from terrorists. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that there's many little details and language that we have to re-understand in this whole process yes. and uh, understand our role in uh, splurging too much money on hair or too much money on <laughs> things that need not cost that much that we need to make ourselves. So we have to understand what we're doing because the rest of the world will not respect us unless we demand our justice, our status, reparation, restitution, and then also the respect that will come. And it's so uh, difficult, the course that I teach on, I'm not supposed to talk too long. Right? Um, oh, anyway, I I'll stop there. <laughs> Let's give Dr. Mack another acknowledgement because he's the, he moves us. And, uh, he's got that, that energy and, and that psychic energy, so we always have to give him an acknowledgement. Thank you, Dr. J. Both Dr. J's. Give them another round of applause. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, again, let us thank all of the people that we can't see that are doing things downstairs that made our stay here uh, pleasant. If there's any food left, you can certainly uh, get that downstairs. Don't forget our vendors. We have two brothers downstairs uh, who have some books and tapes that will uh, educate us even more on our history. And we don't forget you. We thank you for your generosity. We thank our speakers especially. And uh, we thank you, Sister Madge, and uh, the people from the historical organization. Uh, I, I know the initials help. I'm in it now. I joined it. So you got to tell me the name of my organization. Association for the Study of African American Life and History. Associated for the Study of African American Life and History. Founded by Carter G. Woodson. Let's have a round of applause for their <laughs> brother. Can't forget our cultural expression. I mean, it's become an integral part of this program. I'm looking forward to it, and it it helps. I mean, it, it helps to to show so many things. Imagine if our youngsters were listening to the kind of poem like Brother D performed for us today. Give him a round of applause. And everybody that's doing everything is volunteers. Nobody's getting paid, so. Uh, we gotta always give the thanks. Now you, you can, we can stand around a little while. We can socialize. We got about fifteen to twenty minutes. After that twenty minutes, you don't have to go home. <laughs> but you gotta get up out of clock house. That's all. <laughs> so we appreciate you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Get home safe.